right, let's pray. Lord, we love you, we bless you, we trust you, we praise you. We entrust ourselves to you. Help us, Lord, tonight. To go where you want us to go. And help me to stop when I need to stop. In Jesus' name, help me, Lord. Thank you for this and bless the according to this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, amen. Uh, now, according to Albright's Almanac, if you think you see a contradiction in the Bible, dig there because that's where gold is buried. And I think a lot of us, in the back of our mind, when we read stuff in the Bible, it makes us nervous. You know, we believe in God and we believe the Bible is the Word of God, but then sometimes we go, well, that's kind of strange stuff. And you know, I wonder if there's an error there or an error there. Or how can that be true? And I think. I think that's kind of been in the back of a lot of Christians' minds. But I, I've come so far now in my journey and found so many things in places that seemed either contradictory or just totally random. You know, what does that mean? Where is that going? And it turned out to be that the Lord had very treasure there. And it's like a, uh, what they call a scavenger hunt. You know, you find one thing and then it gives you a clue to the next one. I think that's called a scavenger hunt. Um, my friend Dalton says that my ministry is like, <laughs> like the guy on National Treasure because he finds one clue and he has to figure out what that means and then it takes him to the next one so he ultimately finds the treasure. Well, I, uh, I believe that's right in more ways than one. Uh, I can't go into that, but there was a prophecy that seemed to be being echoed, fulfilled by the second National Treasure movie, The Eagle with a Scroll with its talents. But uh, anyway, um, I want to try that. There's, there's two kind of mysteries here that I got on the board. On the inside of the board, and I would like to rehearse these with you guys. And that's saying a lot. Just one of them would make a great teaching and be totally revelational, new stuff to a great many of us. But I think that if we can, and it may be asking a lot, if we can understand both these mysteries, and there's a third mystery right there in plain sight that we may be able to to understand and that's that's where i would like to go tonight i'm not sure that we can and if we do we may end with more of a question mark than an answer and i say this in all the humility i can muster and i don't know about this but i do know that i've found some clues and I am expecting another treasure to blow up in my face. Uh, another moment of Eureka. I found it. Okay, so first, uh, can they see the whiteboard up here over here? Okay, uh, I hope you can read this. It says, the mystery of the missing firstborn. There's two mysteries here. The mystery of the missing ancestors and the mystery of the missing Firstborn. Um, this is based on a pretty simple math deal. If you believe, if you believe about people look at stuff in the Bible and they look, that don't make sense, and they just go on and, oh, what was that? What was up with that? And uh, I think there's something very special here, and it's related to the 273 revelation, 273 plus three revelation which I hope most of y'all are familiar with. It's related to that, but it isn't that. Um, when Israel comes out of Egypt, the first uh, two chapters of Numbers, 
uh, they number the tribes, and that's enough to put put anybody to sleep that's not drinking coffee. Uh, actually, it's in the first chapter. They number all 12 tribes, and they are large, even numbers. Uh, they end in hundreds, fifties, maybe even thousands. But there's not like, you know, 416 or something. There are large, rounded numbers. Um, and the total is, oh, and they're only counting men, and they're only counting those over 20, and they're only counting the 12 tribes and not the 13th tribe, Levi. So it's Israelite, Israelites. Levi is really a separate nation. It's Israelite, Israelites. It's men, and they're 20 and above. And the total was 603,550. That interesting verse is Numbers 146. Numbers 146. Well, you look at that, well, so what? Well, you get on over in Numbers 343 and, and, and following, and there's 22,000, only, only odd number, and all this genealogy, and that's the Lord going, hello. Anybody pay attention? Hello. They numbered the firstborn sons of Israel, and they were sons. And they counted them down to 30 days of age. They counted them down to 30 days of age. They didn't count the Levites. They were from the 12 tribes. And they were down to a month old. The firstborns would have been all the way from a month old to your you had a octogenarians or a hundred year old men and women, a men, because it's all males from 30 days on up. So, this group is a motley crew, you know what I mean? You got teenagers, you got toddlers, you got all different ages, but they're male, and they're all firstborn, and it turns out to be an odd number 22,463. Well, what's wrong with this number besides it's odd? It don't make sense. And that it don't make sense tells us something. If you've got 603,550 20-year-old males in a population, an exploding population, in other words, they've gone from 70 coming into Egypt to, to uh, a couple of million going out. Because if you got this many above 20, you're going to probably have more than that below 20 in an exploding population. It's, it's, uh, you have more young people than you do older people. Anyway, there's a lot of people. There's a couple of million, and they, they, they started with seven. So these people are having a lot of children. A lot of children. Maybe in the order of averaging something like eight or ten. Okay? But here's, what's, here's the problem. A firstborn is defined as the first male born to each woman. Girls were not counted as firstborn. And it's always the first male of each woman, not of the father. A, a guy could have two wives, and there would be in, in the, there could be two firstborns in the family. And if he was a firstborn, it could be three. Okay? So it's counted as first son of each woman. Now, we know that this, if there's this many men, there's more than that many women. Why? Well, number one, they were trying to kill baby, baby boys for a long time. They were, they were wiping them out. Throw them to the crocodiles. You've seen Prince of Egypt. You know what I mean? You read the Bible. Uh, the two midwives tried to save them, but the last verse there says that Pharaoh overruled them, and, and it, it still happened. And any oppressed population, there, there, there's always going to be a tendency to wipe out some of the men and spare the women. Can't have too many women in situations like this as wet you. Uh, and you know, men can be a liability, you know what I mean? They can prevail against you and stuff, but women are always handy for more than one reason. So if there's this many men, there's at least as many women at the age 20. And if these people are having this many babies this fast, you almost 
for sure got at age 20, they were marrying young to have this, I mean, have any babies. You should have about that many firstborn sons. If you've got, say, 700,000 20 year olds and they're all married and they're all fertile and they were fertile. I'm talking fertile. You know, you need to read, read the story of Jacob. I mean, they were having, well, they were having a baby every nine months, maybe nine and a half, but they were spitting them out. And their fertility was so great, remember, it scared the Egyptian. They said, whoa, what is up with these people? I mean, they're, they're like rabbits. So, okay, if there's 700,000 women over age 20, there should be in the neighborhood of at least 600,000 women who have at least one son. Because if you're having a bunch of kids, let's say, let's say they just average seven children each. And they're going to have to average a lot to get up to that many, couple million. Nearly every woman with seven children has at least one son. You get, you get what I'm saying? You know, you got a 50% chance of the first one being male. And the odds of them all being a, a daughter is a half, a half, a half, a half, a half, a half. Okay, that's not much. That's something like 2% of them. So nearly all of these, there should be 600,000 firstborn sons. And remember, they counted the firstborns down to 30 days. So it's not a, it's not a fluke of the counting because they counted for all the firstborns. Why did they do that? Well, one reason they did that, I believe God put that there so we could unearth this, dig in here, biblical archaeology, so to speak. This number should slap us in the face. You know, I have heard more than one person, I think Billy Graham said this, that I'm afraid that only 3% of what we think of as the church are actually born again. I believe it was him that said that. I know that some major figures have used that number 3%. Guess what? This is about 3% of what it should be. What does that mean? It means that they died with Egypt, in Egypt. In other words, they had never done Passover. They were not sure how this was supposed to work out. And they had been complaining against Moses quite a bit. Every time Pharaoh would make things harder, they were grumbling before they ever left Egypt. Okay? And they're expected to take instructions and get it right the first time to get a male lamb a year old and keep it in your house. It's going to be, and it's going to be spotless, perfect, without blemish. Keep it in your house, pinned up for four days. And people said, well, that was so they could get fond of it. And when they killed it, they could, they could be sad. No, no, no. They were getting the, the stuff out of their guts. If you put him up and, and don't feed him for four days, you just give him water. They were supposed to eat the guts. And you want the guts to be empty. When, they, when you, the, the, the Passover lamb was roasted, the roasted whole, and it says, eat the entrails, all of it, you skin it, you roast it, and you're supposed to eat all of it. I don't know about you, but Passover lamb represents Christ, and I want Jesus' guts. I want Jesus' guts. I want the inner parts. I want the part that nobody else wants. I'll take it. Give me the guts. I want to have as much guts as Jesus, okay? And those guts, though, <clears throat> needed to be empty, so the animal fasted four days, so it's bawling and screaming. And you know how a, a year old, it's not a nursing lamb, so it's not bawling because it's not weaned. It's a one-year-old, so it's already weaned, but it's going to be hungry. And it's going to be, bah! can you imagine if there's a, you know, 500,000 of these lambs going, bah! Feed me. Probably getting louder for four, every day for four days. And then you cut its throat. 
had to start four days in advance. And on Passover, you cut his throat. That's probably a relief. Shut the thing up. Put the blood over the doorpost. On the sides, nipples, fish over. And roast it. Everybody stay inside. They cooked it inside. And eat it. All of it. Oh, nobody goes out. Nobody leaves the house. You stay under the blood. Do not leave the house, and you'll be covered by the blood. Well, they're, they're, they're probably thinking most of them, what's the big deal with the blood on the doorpost? What's the big deal with not leaving the house? What's the big deal with putting up for four days? What's the big deal with it being spotless? I say 97%. I'm sorry to say this, but I think the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, has hardened many a heart where we've said, okay, you know, grace, 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 grace uncovered, and there's no real fear of God among most Christians. There's no obedience, zealous obedience to do exactly what he said. Any way you slice it, this ain't enough first for 600,000 women having babies. And essentially all of them have at least one son. You divide this number into this number, you get three percent. Three and a half cents. So, the mystery of the missing first one. This is the kind of thing, you know, you read the book of numbers and 600,000 over here. And Fifty thousand up here, and fifty thousand up here, and twenty thousand up here. And like, okay, good guy. When I get done with this, stop and look at it. And stop. Now it actually says, describing it in, in, in um, chapter chapter twelve, in chapter twelve of uh, of Exodus, where it describes. You know, the command to do the Passover, and it actually says that Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. Is that not contradicting what I just said? I think when Paul said in Romans 9, not all Israel is Israel, he knew that. These guys had this stuff memorized. Paul would have had this book memorized and meditated on all of his life, and they knew that this number was strange. And they knew this verse here said, All Israel did what Moses said. I say to you that a whole lot of who we think is the church is really easy. And you don't find it out until the death angel. You'll find out the judgment. So, I think that it's a warning for us on whom the ends of ages have come. These things are written down for us on whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, every letter. It's 11. Um, I think when I say that, it goes your your mind, like my mind goes over friends, relatives that we know are pretty lukewarm. And uh, we know they believe that they are believers. And I love the grace of God. And I sure hope it's a lot more than three percent. But there have been those who have said 3%. And they didn't know about this. Okay. Now, having talked about that, let's move over here to the mystery of the missing ancestors. We actually did that a little quicker than I thought. The mystery of the missing ancestors. 
Okay, I should didn't write this up here, but I will now. Uh, I'm going to write this kind of sideways. First, Chronicles 7. I'm going to write it out there. First Chronicles chapter 7. Okay? That's where this comes from. Genealogy of Joseph to Joshua. Now, isn't that exciting? I mean, how how old can it be? It lists off Joseph and his son named Ephraim and on down. And remember, they were in Egypt for 30 years. And by the way, there are a lot of people that they look at these contradictions and they say, Yeah, I know that the Bible says twice in Exodus 12, 40, and 41 that the length of time that Israel was in Egypt was four and thirty years of the very day. I know it says that, but it can't mean that because it's, uh, there's, there's other things to contradict this. I'm going to show you what they're talking about, what their problem is, and, and where the goal is buried in that seeming contradiction. And that this proves that is another proof. If, if the Lord saying it twice wasn't enough already, they came out to the very day. Okay. So Joseph. So Joshua is 12 generations. That's average of age 35 at each generation. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. That's a reasonably fertile time. And they generally married women a little younger than they were. So that's that's a reasonable number. 430 years. Because Joseph is there when they enter Egypt. Obviously, he's 39 years old. And Joshua is there when they come out of Egypt with Moses, right? That's no big mystery there. And 12 generations total from the beginning and the end, that's that's not out of problem. What but that's kind of buried over in First Chronicles 7, and so people don't see it. But it's there. And what they do see, the more out in your face, and this is where they have a problem, and they say, well. Israel couldn't really have been in Egypt for 30 years. That must be talking about going back to Abraham. To the, to the Exodus, Abraham to the Exodus. Well, that ain't what it says. And that here makes that conjecture totally unnecessary. But here's why they think that. Because in chapter 6 of Exodus, maybe I should write that here, uh, Exodus 6, Okay, that's where this comes from. The genealogy, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob. He was among those who entered Egypt. Remember there was 70, I just said that a while ago. Jacob and his family were numbered 70 when they entered Egypt. 430 years later to the day they came out. Levi was one of his sons, he was his third son in fact, and he lived to be 137 years old. Levi did, okay? Kohath, his son, lived to be 133 years old. Okay, and his son, Amram, lived to be 133, uh, excuse me, 137, 137 years old. And Moses, it'd be 120, but Moses was 80 at the time of the ex Exodus, tote, <laughs> tote. At the time of the Exodus, Moses was 80. I remember that. Okay. So you can't get 430 years out of this. I mean, even if. If, if you say this guy was born the day he died, this guy was born the day he died, and this guy was born the day he died, and it wouldn't matter that anyway, because Levi is, he's, he's, he's about 55 when they enter Egypt. And guess what? Guess who's on the list of the 70 when they enter Egypt? The three sons of Levi. And Kohath is among them. That's Genesis chapter 47. Genesis 47 gives you the 70 
of the tribe of Israel. That was Israel when Israel, the land, entered Egypt. And Kohath was already born. And even if he's just a day old, you're a long way from 430 years. You know, if he's born the day they entered Egypt, he's what? Because he's got two brothers. They ain't got anything like 430 years, and that's why they say, Hey, uh, they, they can't, the Bible can't mean that. It's kind of embarrassing. It says 430 years every day. It says twice because, look, this we can't, it don't work. Strange though, it does work for Joseph's genealogy without stretching anything. Average age of 35. Here's the missing ancestor. There are some missing ancestors, and I've always said between right right here, if there's a missing ancestors between Oath and Amram. Now let me uh, I'll change that in a minute, but let me back this up a little bit. Okay, Jesus himself refers in Revelation chapter two to being blotted out of the book. Being blotted out of the book is in the Bible a lot. Uh, Israel. And Judges 21 says, Oh God, don't let Benjamin be blotted out of the book. David got mad at Saul and said, Do let him be blotted out of the book. Elijah prophesied over the house of Ahab and cursed the house of Ahab. So you may have seen this before. I have done this before. But in Jesus' genealogy, there's three people missing, and it is the grandson, great-grandson, and great-great-grandson of Ahab. They're missing in Jesus' genealogy. Why is a contradiction? Did he manipulate it? It, it, it? it says, you know, Matthew says in chapter 1, another little chapter we don't want to read, it's the big acts. If there's 14 generations from Abraham to David, and 14 generations from David, to the exile and 14 generations from the exile of Christ, what well, it comes up nice and even if you pull three out, like he's cooking the books, like Matthew's cooking the books so you'd have three 14. Now, this middle 14 has got three missing, but God said to take them out. Why? Because, you know, this is a, you know, the Davidic line. This, this middle 14 starts with David. But they go down there and they got some really bad kings and some really bad kings. And then one of the best kings is named Jehoshaphat, but he was going to try to compromise and reunite. The kingdom had been divided into Judah in the south and Israel in the north, and he was trying to try to get it back together by playing nice with the wicked and getting Ahab's daughter for his daughter-in-law to marry his son Jehoram. So righteous Jehoshaphat is doing really stupid. He's got a daughter-in-law named Athaliah. And they have a son named Ahaziah, who has a son named Joash, who has a son named Amaziah. Those three guys, the grandson, the great-grandson, and the great-great-grandson of Ahab through his daughter, Athaliah. It could have been a daughter. Athaliah may have been a daughter of Jezebel. We don't know. Because they have made, I'm sure, had more than one wife because he had 70 sons. Okay, so it may not, not, don't want to say more than the Bible says. It doesn't say it's Jezebel's daughter, but you know, she's from that household. And she said, anyway, there's a curse. And so those three guys end very badly. And when Jesus' genealogy, remember I said Jehoram is Jehoshaphat's son. And the arranged marriage was going to marry Athaliah, Ahab's daughter. And Jehoram is in Jesus' genealogy. But then it skips down to Uzziah. It says Jehoram was the father. And the, their word for father and forefather was basically the same. Was the father of Uzziah, also known as Amaziah. But Uzziah, in, like in the year of the king Uzziah, that you, we're, we're kind of familiar with. Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the Lord. You're, you're, you're the king who died. died. I was in the temple. I saw the Lord. I lifted up and trained to the temple. So Uzziah was this king that lived over 50, reigned over 50 years. He did, that's right. He did about, he reigned about 50 years. Anyway, he did 
did good except for right at the very end. Anyhow, Jehoram was not the father, father of Uzziah, or the grandfather, or the great grandfather, but he was the great, great grandfather of Uzziah, but especially his father. So what I'm saying is, the whole point is, and you see, I get my board cool. I could, I could put all that genealogy up there for you, but it's in the, it's in your Bible. All you got to do is look at Matthew chapter one and read the genealogy. It says Jehoram was the father of Uzziah, and then just turn right over to First and Second Kings, especially the beginning of Second Kings. And there you got it: Jehoram, Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah, and then Uzziah. I know I'm Uzziah and Uzziah and y'all to pieces, but my point is three guys were blotted out of Jesus' genealogy. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for Moses. Okay? So but my point is if wickedness can get you blotted out, and it did, even Jesus' genealogy, hello? Bad guys and bad curse and bad ancestor Ahab was really, really bad. And Remember, Joseph was an extremely righteous man, extremely, and Joshua is 12th great-grandson, 12th great stand or whatever. He was a righteous man, and none of these guys are bought it out. They're all listed in the book. It would appear that that's a whole genealogy, perfect, nobody's left out, because they're 35 years on average apart, 35.8 years apart. You, know, you divide 400, divide 12 into 430, and you get you 35.8. You understand 12 generations, 430 years, they were in Egypt, okay? So anyway, it works out fine. This works out terrible, and it makes people think, well, the 430 years must be not me. Because it couldn't. Because you got to leave like old Abraham and Moses. And that, you know, you can't, and, and see, the Lord, he didn't have to tell us that he, Died at one, the Levi died at 137, and Kohath died at 133, and Amram died at 137, and Moses is 80 in the league. But if he just left that information out, we wouldn't even bother. We wouldn't even have a problem. But you know, sometimes the Lord causes us problems. He buries stuff so that we can have the glory of digging it out. You think? You think it's the glory of God to. To conceal a matter, make it look like a contradiction, and the glory of kings to search it out. I don't want to be a king. You see what I'm saying? Levi was Joseph's brother, Moses was Joshua's partner, right? Moses and Joshua, they let him let through the Red Sea, they let him through the desert. These two guys are brothers. So these are contemporaries. And there's 10 between Joseph and Joshua, and only two between Levi and Moses. Okay, you see what I'm saying? There's a mystery there. And the mystery is that there's a blotting out. Why would I say there's a blotting out? Remember, Ahab was wicked, therefore there's a blotted out. Levi was a wicked man. The last we hear from him, as far as his behavior, he and Simeon did mass murder, <clears throat> lied, manipulated, deceived, and, and wiped out the Shechemites, and Jacob pronounced a curse on what they had done. But somewhere, somewhere, somebody repeated. And that's the good news, because you've got Moses and his parents are righteous people. They're just before, in the century before the Exodus, and they're 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 walking with God. And they got the favor of God. And they got the blessing of God. And God's got got His hand on this Moses from his birth. It says he was a Tob child. He was Tob. Uh, they, they say the Talmud, say, Talmud says that um, Moses' actual given name, you know, Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses. But 
his parents named him Tobia, which, you know, it says he was a Tov. Tov is a good child, beautiful child. So it come, probably comes from that. Tobia. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof. If I was a rich man, Tobia. Uh, somebody remember that Fiddler on the Roof? You got to yeah, Fiddler on the Roof's the best. It's awesome. Yes. Yes, yeah, I love it. I mean, it's a musical. 1971, I think. But it is great. Anyway, it needs a sequel out there. Somebody make a sequel. Will they get saved in America? Hello. Anyway. So, uh, now I've actually covered this quicker than I thought that I might. Um, now let's say that I'm entering into a mystery moment. And you're going you're gonna go, well Miles, where are you going with this? Well, I think where would the trip has been worth it if nothing else. Excuse me while I get into some water. The trip has been worth it if nothing else. Because I think you you have seen the ways of God. These mysteries. Right there in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. I asked the Lord 20 years to explain this to me. And he finally showed me in 2017. 20 years. I stumbled up on the Bible. First Chronicles 7. All of a sudden, yeah. When I saw Joseph's genealogy, you know, they had to be parallel. There's 12 of them. There's only four of these. I remembered the blotting out thing and that Levi was a wicked man. I had been, just been studying about how Jesus' genealogy had three guys wiped out. So it all came together. It all fit. Anyway, where am I going with this? Well, I'm going to suggest something. And it's going to look like I am contradicting uh, the word. Uh, and you may, I may be telling you more than you want to know. Um, but I believe that just beneath the surface here, there's something, and we're just starting to scratch the dirt away to start to see what is under here. I want to show you Exodus, in particular, Exodus chapter 6 and Numbers chapter 26. And I, I'm sorry if this is really heavy tonight, but you know, because all these names kind of circle around and it's kind of tough. But if you, did, if you did, don't know what I, this mystery here, and I think also this one over here, what I'm fixing to say won't make any sense, but if you know those things, this can make some sense. Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses. Okay? Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses. Just four names. That's a lot. But bear with me. Levi, Kohath, Amram, Moses. And it says, see, the, the word for. Uh, be, became the father of can also mean became the grandfather of or was the ancestor of became the mother of was the ancestor of sometimes that can mean that now I've always thought that Amram and his wife Jochebed were the literal parents of Moses and Aaron and Miriam but I'm going to show you about five reasons tonight why I think that they weren't. And once we get that established, I think beneath that rock is buried something else. Now, why do people say that that, that was his parents? And why would I contradict that? Exodus chapter, I'll show you. Now, I think most people who present a doctrine don't show the other argument. I always want to show the other guy's argument 
And what this, this is really not a controversial thing because nobody, as far as I know of, even questions that they were the parents. I think that we're going to see tonight that they were. They were the ancestors. All right. Exodus chapter 6 and verse, Exodus chapter 6 is this peculiar chapter inserted in and it suddenly gives you the uh, ancestry, short ancestry of Reuben and Simeon and then Levi and then it stops. But it really goes into detail with Levi, Levi's children and grandchildren. Gives you a brief one of the first two and then the third one, and they don't say anything about number four or five through twelve. It's a strange chapter, but I, I approach this more and more and more every day with a reverence. This thing is perfect. You just have to see how these things fit together. And the Lord is testing us when he does stuff like this, when he says, Levi, go have him around. Moses 137, 133, 137, 138. You don't see that. You don't see a genealogy listed anywhere else in the Bible that tells the ages of each person. I, 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 anybody, I tell you what, I'll offer a reward. Five dollars if anybody can show me a genealogy where they do that in the Bible. This is unique. And God does this to test us. God does this to test us. Now, uh, in chapter 6 of, of Exodus, and again, again, I'm kind of thrashing around here. Um, if I can read all this, I'm going to kind of lose you in all the verbiage. But down in verse 20, it says, Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed, and bore him Aaron, Moses. Um, later on, it says Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. Amram, Amram lived 137 years. Now, I, I submit that we're, we're going to believe in a few minutes that it's going to say Amram and Jochebed from whom came who were the ancestors of Moses and Aaron. And, but again, you know, I'm showing you why people don't believe what I'm going to show you is true in a few minutes. Uh, first, I'm going to show you the other side, the other, the other argument. Now, um, all right, so I'm answering a question nobody's asking. <laughs> you know, welcome to my world. But again, um, in chapter 26 of Numbers, it says Kohath was the forefather. And again, it says forefather there. Uh, that's kind of interesting. But it's literally the word father. In the NIV, it says Kohath was the forefather of Amram. Why do they say it's the forefather of Amram? Because they think that Am you know, Kohath walked into Egypt with Jacob. He's a little fellow. He could have been five, he could have been 15. But he walked in Kohath, okay? Remember? Levi walks into Egypt with his dad, but he's got three boys. Kohath is one of them. And they don't want to say Kohath was the father of Amram. Because it seems to contradict. So that NIV said puts forefather. And that's valid to do that sometimes. Because again, quite often, father and forefather are, are, are used interchangeably. Um, I'm sh shifting way over here, but Belteshazzar, who saw the handwriting on the wall, was said to be the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Actually, he was the maternal grandson. So that's an example. Uh, but it says, Kohath was the forefather of Amram. If you read in the, in the uh, interlinear, it'll just say the father of Amram. What verse is that? I'm sorry. Numbers 26 and verse 58. And then it says the name of Amram's wife was Yochabed, and it says a descendant of Levi. It doesn't say descendant. It says a daughter of Levi. Okay, I know this is getting complicated here, but Kohath Exodus six says Kohath had a sister. You can't you you might get by by saying that Amram married a descendant of Levi. 
It actually said a dollar. But you might say, okay, well, it means descendant. But you can't get by with that because it says Kohath had a sister. We know Kohath is Levi's literal son because he walked into Egypt with him. You with me? Levi walked into Egypt. He's part, he was part of the 70 and his three sons. And one of them was Kohath. was part of the 70 and, and he had a sister named Jochebed. The glory of Jehovah, the glory of Yahweh. Amram married his aunt. Oh, me. Amram married his aunt. And unless she's 300 years old, Amram, Amram has to be the literal son of Kohath. It says he's his son. But we think that Amram and Jochebed were his parents. And I'm going to show you one. Oh, God, I hope I hadn't messed up. I want to show you why. I'm, I've always thought that Amram and Jochebed were his parents, but they can't be. And underneath that, there's a mystery. Amram has to. God throws these peculiar things in there. We know that Amram is the literal son of Kohath because it says he's the son, but that we think that can't be true because it, it says that he's the, we think it says that he's the parents. This is the parents of Moses. But, but Kohath had a sister named Jochebed that he married. He didn't marry a 300 year old woman. She would have been 250, 300 years old. If she was literally. Now, let me show you this. Oh, God. Oh, God, help me. All right, let me show you why Amram can't be the natural father. All right. Oh, God. Numbers chapter 3. Numbers chapter 3. Y'all look, if it's in the Bible, and especially if it's in there as a mystery, I want to know it. I'm the only one. And everybody else, you know, we all go away. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I was alone when the, I got to 73. And I don't want to be alone the rest of the time. But, but y'all, uh, in Numbers chapter 3, um, look, at, look at verse 27. And again, this is the stuff that you read and you just go to sleep on, okay? But let's read it and not go to sleep. Remember, it says to Kohath, to Kohath belong the clan, the clans of what? The Amramites, Israelites, Hebronites, and Uzielites. In other words, Kohath is this major division, but underneath him are these divisions. So you got Levi, and he's got three sons, and those are major divisions. Kohath's one of them. Kohath, Gershon, and Merai are the three sons of Levi. But even there are clans called Amramites, Izharites, Hebronites, and Uzielites. Y'all, if Amram, okay, look, these four, these four clans have a total of 8,600 male descendants. Do you see that? The number of all the males a month old were 8,600. In other words, there's 8,600 men coming from these four clans. Do you see that? The four clans of Kohath. I'm going to read this again. To verse 27, 327. To Kohath belong the clans of Amramites, Israelites, Hebronites, and Uzziah. That's his sons. These were the Kohathite clans. That's the four divisions. The number of all the males a month old or more was 8,600. And the Kohathites were responsible for the furniture. That's what it's going to go on to say. They had, they had the Ark of the Covenant and lampstand and all that. Altar of incense. They took care of all of that. Kohath had a brother named Merari and one named Gershon. Gershon took care of the fabric of the tabernacle, the, 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 the tent stuff, okay? 
Merard had carried the poles. They had the whole, he put up the poles and then Gerson put the tin over it and then Kohath put the furniture in. Okay, but within Kohath, there's four clans. And the total of them is 8,600, which means there's a little over 2,000 in each of those four clans. The Amramites, the Israelites, the Hebronites, and others. Do you see that Amram couldn't have 2,000 children? If Amram is Moses' father, Moses has got 2,000 brothers and sisters. Do you see that? Do you see that? The Amramites are a couple of thousand because him and his three brothers got 8,600 descendants. So the Amramites are 2,000 or so. So Moses, Amram and Jochebed didn't have 2,000 kids. They were fertile. Now, that's one reason that I think that they, Amram and Jochebed, which we've always thought was his parents, weren't. Look at this. Exodus chapter 2. Okay, Miles, where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. But I'm, I've learned something new, and it's related to all these other things. And, and one of these days, the unifying theory is going to happen. God's going to pull all these things together, and we're going to understand the Bible. This is my mission in life. Chapter 2 of Exodus. Now, a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. That's the son, guess what? He's Moses. He's already got an older brother and sister. There's something special about it. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months, and yada, yada, yada. I don't know the thing about it. He makes an ark out of the bulrushes, and hides him in the water, and winds up being adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. We know what's really peculiar here. The parents are not named. Nowhere in the story of this man of the house of Levi married that Levi woman, it doesn't say Amram married Jacobi. Why wouldn't it? Why would it just say a man and a woman from the house of Levi? Why did God do that? Why would it not put him in there? And then later on, leave us with a mystery that looks like it's saying that Amram is his daddy daddy, but he can't be because he's an actual son of Kohath. He has to be because there's the Amramite Amram clan with 2,000 in it. Okay? And Amram had a sister. It's, you, can't, you, can't, you can't miss sister. And you can miss mom and daddy because the way the words are. The, the daddy could actually be granddaddy or great granddaddy. But sister is sister. And Kohath had a sister that Amram married. That's peculiar. Also, here's another reason. At the time of Moses, a man marrying his aunt was illegal. At the time of Moses, Leviticus 18, it's a forbidden marriage. You don't marry your daddy's sister. But if it had happened 400 years before, 300 years before, that's another deal. That's another dispensation. So there's another reason. You know, a man doesn't marry his aunt at the time of Moses. Uh, now, the, the last thing here, and, and y'all, this may have been the boringest thing I've ever shared. This may have been the most obtuse thing I've ever shared. But I'm sorry I got excited about it because I learned something new. And when I learned something new, it zings me. And it, I, got, I just learned this morning. In fact, it kind of detained a little bit. But I was, you know, Sperry wasn't there anyway. So anyway, so worked out. Let me show you this. 
uh, Kohath, Levi, okay, had three sons. Okay, and that's the, okay. Remember, Levi is the son of Jacob. Okay, there's twelve sons of Jacob. Okay, you know, Levi is one of them. He winds up that family winds up being priests. It wasn't to begin with. Levi was actually a very wicked man. But Levi had three sons, and he walks into Levi walks into Egypt with these three little boys. Okay, and I didn't write down. I wrote down two of them. I'm running out of space up here. But two of them was named Kohath and Merari. Okay, the other one is Gershon over here. And I didn't write it down because I'm just overwhelming in my book. My board's full. Why don't you have which one? Why don't you have a big whiteboard, brother? As a matter of fact, we have to loosen this stuff so we can get everything. I use all the whiteboard. You know, it's it's not it's just like you know, 10 feet's not enough. I need 15. Okay. Uh you know, now you know why this whiteboard's here. I mean, think about it. Just wait. Is this thing in the way of them seeing? Yeah, okay. All right. I think it's probably better. All right. Yeah. So, so Kohath and Merari was two of the three sons uh, of Levi, and they were boys or young men walking into Egypt with their granddaddy Jacob. And they are said to have clans underneath them. I guess their families, their Levite, Levite families, Kohath, Merari, and actually Gershon is over here. I'll just write a G over here because it's just too much to write everything down. Gershon. Well, I'll write Gershon. Gershon. That's the, that's the third brother. And he had some sons. But specifically, Marari, how many of you remember, remember Rawhide? Rawhide, remember that? You, what was uh, the cook's name? Was uh, it Rooster? Rooster? Something like that. But the cook's assistant's name was Mushy. Mushy. Did you know that that's a biblical name? The cook's assistant was kind of a goofy guy. I think they were portraying this kind of slow. He's a good-looking boy. Um, Rohi, his name was Mushy. Well, Marari had two sons, Mushy and Molly. Like Molly, like Molly Skaggs, okay? As it would be a girl's name today, but it's spelled M-A-H-L-I, Molly, okay? But Molly, girl's name, is Mushy. That's terrible names for Marari to give them. Again, Marari is the son of Levi. And the Merariites are the one that carry the poles. You know, when, when, they, when and they journeyed in the desert, the Merariites, the, the Levites, broke up into three groups. The ones with the poles for the tabernacle, the ones with the fabric for the tabernacle, and the ones with the furniture. Now, you can see why the ones with the poles would get there first. Because you put up the poles, and then the guys behind you has got the fabric, and they put up make the tent. You see what I'm saying? You don't need the fabric till you get the poles up. You get them in place. You get them set in place. So the Marauders were kind of like the pioneers. Whenever they put their poles down, that decided where the tabernacle was going to be. And then after them comes the Gershonites carrying the fabric. And then last of all, the Kohathites come carrying the furniture. Now, I'm going off a little bit here, but Marariites were given by the children of Israel ox carts to carry the poles. They were very heavy. Even though there's a thousand of these guys or more. Thousands of these guys. They didn't have to carry those poles. And these Gershonites, they didn't have to carry all that fabric. They were given ox carts too. The Marariites were given exactly twice as many ox carts as the Gershonites were, because the poles were heavier, apparently. But the Kohathites were not given ox carts. You don't put the Ark of the Covenant on a what? Ox on an ox cart. Who, who learned that the hard way? Remember there was somebody. David learned that the hard way, remember? David, when he 
becomes king, he says, hey, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant home. And he puts it on a ox cart, like a pole or a fabric, and it ain't a pole, and it ain't a fabric. The Kohathites had to carry their stuff by hand. They wrapped it up, too. You didn't, I didn't walk, walk around like in the seeing pictures and movies of the Ark of the Covenant shining stuff. It was wrapped up in, in three layers. Okay? They may not have done that, but in, in any case, they were supposed to wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. And it had the poles sticking out. And they carried four Levites were carried. I imagine every once in a while they'd swap. Because you had a couple thousand. Anyway, so the, you're getting the point now. There's three different clans of the Levites. Excuse me, three different families. Kohath, Merari, and Gershon. And these, their, their sons are called the clans. When you read about it, the Maliite clans and the Mushiite clans. And there, were, there was like two or three thousand of these. And two or three thousand of these. Maybe four thousand. Of these. Okay. Same here. You got 8,600 descendants from these four men. Amramite. And I forgot how many Gershonites, but it's right there in Numbers chapter 3. It's leading up to 273 Revelation. The Gershonite clans are, woo, Gershonite clans that were in, um, Okay, I'll quit. I'll quit. I'll quit. Uh, how many girls in that clan? But, but there are thousands of them. So what I'm saying is, Amram couldn't have been. No way. He had to be the literal son of Kohath. He got thousands of descendants, and he married this guy's sister. Even though it says the way it reads in English that Amram and Jochebed. For their parents, it's got to be saying they were their ancestors. If one reason it's unusual is it's telling us the father and the mother. Well, there's a mystery there too, and I don't get all of it. But even if you doubted that the 430 years is 430 years, still, it was just this many years. Amram has got to. Be the ancestor. And Jokerbed has got to be the ancestor of Moses. And I apologize tonight if I have led you down a blind canyon. And you're like, okay, so what? <laughs> I stood with you all the way through this. So what? Well, welcome to my world. I'm not, there's a lot of times I've knocked and knocked and knocked on the door. The other people don't even know the door is there. They're not even looking at it. But then all of a sudden, it opens up. And Brother really giving me a word lately, which kind of encourages me toward in this direction, is that there's a, a major, major, major deal coming. You think he has that prophetically. I mean, it, it, it's some understanding. Well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is major. About Josh, the, the descendants of Joseph, Joseph and the descendants of Levi, I, I think that's awesome. And this is major over here about this. And then see, the 273 thing comes in here too. This is, this is where we get the 273. And if it wasn't already gone, it's already said maybe too much, I would go in and talk about this. There's some mystery here that I'm understanding. But I've given you. More than you can bear. Jesus said to his disciples, I have more to say to you than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of Truth, comes, he will reveal everything to you. So Miles may have told you more than you can now bear, whereas Jesus didn't. But on the other hand, maybe Jesus had partly. In mind, I mean, he he knew, I'm sure, that among these disciples, these twelve that were there, there were going to be these guys writing Matthew and John 
and the epistles of John and Revelation. Yes. And that later on there'd be a guy come named Luke come along and a guy named Paul come along and they would write stuff. But I'm thinking that that the Lord's got some stuff for us to understand in these last days. Lord, I bow my head and my heart before you. All I can just say really is help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus, to uh, be hungry and thirsty. Hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And hungering and thirsting to know the mysteries. Paul was a mystery chaser, a mystery revealer. Help me, Lord, to do the apostolic work in these days and to bring to earth that has never been brought before. Help us to understand. And may we be a, a company of champions, thread checkers. And um, may we know that this is not a one man show. That uh, each part does its work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.